You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. This is the Useless Information Podcast. I am Steve Silverman. Useless Information. As I've mentioned many times over the years, I'm a high school science teacher by day. And while doing research for today's story, I was reminded of something that happened many years ago at my job. Now, I will tell you this, I'm not 100% sure this is totally accurate, so just kind of take it with a grain of salt. Supposedly, a former superintendent told us we could no longer have our annual holiday party anywhere within the county limits. Now, the rationale was really simple. Since we're teachers, we're role models for our students, and we shouldn't be seen consuming alcohol. Not that I drink anyway. The issue was quickly resolved with an agreement that we could have our celebration anywhere that we wished, but no student could be on staff at the restaurant while we were there. And there's no doubt that teaching and some other professions are held to higher standards than other professions, and that's perfectly fine with me. And I do have a very sarcastic sense of humor, so I've joked over the years, you know, the teachers don't get pregnant, you know, that would imply something, you know, what is going on. Instead, all teachers have their babies delivered the old-fashioned way, you know, by a stork. Well, my really bad sense of humor aside, today's story doesn't involve a stork. Instead, the baby that we're going to talk about was delivered in an even more unusual way, by a dog. So let's take a trip back in time to the Great Depression and make a visit to Pearl River, Louisiana. This is where we'll find the home of 24-year-old Effie Hinton Crawford and her husband, who is 44-year-old Louis Elijah Crawford. The couple is the proud parents of two boys, their 4-year-old Louis Jr. and 2-year-old James Edward Crawford. Together, the four of them lived in a tiny one room that's 25 by 14 feet or 7.6 by 4.3 meter. They lived in a tiny one-room clapboard-sided cabin. Their sole source of income was $26 per month, and that came from Lewis's job working for the federal government's WPA, or Works Progress Administration. And to give you an idea how little that is, that'd be about $468 per month today. It would be very, very difficult to live on that. Hurting badly for money, the couple made the decision to refrain from marital relations, you know, because there's simply no way they could afford to support a third child. Neither one could have imagined it, but the Crawford's world would be completely turned upside down and inside out by an incident that occurred on November 11th, 1936. Mrs. Crawford said she'd been sitting on the porch of their home when her eyes caught an animal running through the weeds. Of course, wild animals are nothing unusual when living in the piney woods, but there was something very different this time. Effie heard what sounded like a whimper, and then she observed that it was a dog carrying some sort of bundle with its teeth. It was just about the fall of the night. This big black dog came trotting through the brush with something white in his mouth. When he saw me, he stopped, and I was so scared all I could do was stand there. She later stated... I'd never seen the dog before. Most of the dogs around here are hounds, and this one looked like a brindle bull. Then, while I was looking, the white thing moved, and I heard a baby's cry. When I realized it was a baby, I got a cold chill. She described what happened next. I ran off the porch. Put that down, you. Put it down. Clapped my hands and made like I was going to hit him, and that scared him off. Effie attempted to restrain the dog, but she was unable to do so. Her attention then turned to what her senses had interpreted could be a baby. As she carefully unwrapped the filthy square of cotton, she discovered a small infant boy who appeared to be just days old, facing downward toward the ground. Her motherly instincts immediately kicked in, and she raced the baby into the house. Effie wrapped the newborn in a clean towel and proceeded to place him between the covers of the couple's bed. For additional warmth, she lit a fire in their makeshift stove, which really was nothing more than a modified oil drum. She next grabbed a baby bottle and prepared condensed milk to feed the child. Lastly, Mrs. Crawford summoned the help of Mrs. Lizzie Crawford, 
who's both a midwife and a distant relative. After examination, the eight-pound, rosy-cheeked, blonde-haired, blue-eyed baby was declared to be in relatively good health. When her husband Lewis arrived home later, she told him about this bizarre incident. And at first, he was certain she must be joking. She'd done that before. But this time, Effie wasn't. She took him to the bed, and there he saw the baby for the very first time. Clearly, this baby had to belong to someone. So Mr. Crawford contacted parish officials and told them of his wife's discovery. It wasn't long in the small town before word spread throughout the community and the crowd started to gather around the Crawford home. And it seemed like everyone just wanted to get a glimpse of the baby. This deeply religious group felt that the baby was a divine gift intended not only for the Crawfords, but for the community as a whole. Some 50 different people offered to adopt the baby, but Effie and Lewis quickly decided that they wanted to become the child's parents. We're going to call him Moses because he was found by a miracle. It's just like Moses in the bulrushes. I think we were meant to keep him. Miracle or not, the Crawfords were now celebrities. Word of her discovery quickly made the national papers, and soon reporters were descending upon their small community. Now, against the wishes of the Crawfords and the community as a whole, the juvenile officer for the St. Tammany Parish signed an order that removed the baby from their household. Baby Moses was taken by welfare officer Mrs. Emily Hasbro and a WPA nurse to Charity Hospital in New Orleans, which is about 40 miles or 65 kilometers away. When you are poor and you don't have transportation, that is like a million miles away. Physicians examined the baby and confirmed that he really was in good health, despite that exposure to the elements. He was placed in an incubator, and the name Moses was written in large letters across its front. Investigators began their search for the parents of the child. Truck driver Sam Ferguson, who was a neighbor of the Crawfords, told us seeing a young couple walking on a road about one mile from the Crawford home. He added that in addition to a small girl who walked alongside the couple, he observed that they had a large dog and that the woman was holding a small baby. Word was immediately sent to all nearby police to keep an eye out for the suspected couple. Quote, We are looking for the couple, Police Chief P.A. Saxton of nearby Slidell said. He added, If they have a baby with them, they are all right. But if they haven't, We know we've got the right couple. Unfortunately, a statewide search failed to locate the suspected parents. Effie continued her plea to get baby Moses back. I found that baby. I saved his life. I'm not going to give him up. I'll move heaven and earth to get him back. On November 13th, a reporter from the Times-Picayune in New Orleans, a guy named Thomas Sancton, entered the story. He wasn't sure where the couple's cabin was, so he stopped at the home of Lewis's uncle, that's a guy named Fletcher Crawford, to ask for directions. Call it a hunch, a white lie, or whatever, but somehow Sancton convinced Fletcher that Effie's story was just, you know, totally false. So Fletcher took Sancton up to the house, and upon entering, Effie asked, What do you want? To which Fletcher replied, quote, Effie, here's a newspaper reporter. He said you told how you are the mother of the baby you said you found with the dog the other night. Did you? Effie then broke into tears and stated, I ain't told nobody nothing. Not nobody. Effie then asked the reporter to step outside. She walked barefoot alongside him to the pigsty and then admitted what had really happened. I don't want them all to hear. I told my husband. He knows. As she was telling her story, her husband Lewis came outside, and the reporter decided to ask him how he felt about it. He replied very simply, I love Effie. Clearly the cat was now out of the bag. Effie now claimed that she had given birth to baby Moses around 11 in the evening on Sunday of November 8, 1936. But was she really the mother? 
Could this all be another lie so she could convince the authorities to let her keep the baby? The only way to know for sure would to have a doctor check to see if she had recently given birth. Well, I'm going to leave in a bit of suspense as to what the doctors found out. That's because we're going to take a quick break to hear from the sponsor of today's podcast. But when we return, you get to hear exactly what happened to Effie when she was taken to the doctors. All I will tell you right now is that these are doctors you hope never, ever to see. Welcome back. We're going to continue our story just as Effie was being taken to the doctor to determine if she had truly given birth to baby Moses. So Mrs. Crawford was taken to be examined by Dr. F. F. Young Jr. and Dr. H. E. Gatro. What's a bit unusual about these doctors is that they were the Tammany Parish coroner and assistant coroner, respectively. Their report stated that Effie Crawford had given birth to a baby, quote, without the question of a doubt within the past few days. It was about 11 o'clock. I had been ma- laboring for about an hour. I had to take matches and light a little pile of straw to give me enough light. It was awful dark. After the child was born, I wrapped it in a cloth and I laid it behind a little building there and I went into the house. In the morning, Lewis went to work with the WPA. I kept the baby in the house all day Monday and hid him out behind the stove Monday night, then went to work Tuesday. I was thinking all day of what to do. Then I thought of the dog. When Lewis came home Tuesday, I pulled back the bed covers and showed him the baby and told him how a big dog came through the woods with the baby in its mouth and how I took it away from him. District Attorney C. Sidney Frederick told the press that Mrs. Crawford had broken no known criminal statute and therefore would not be charged with a crime. As for the baby, however, he said custody would have to be decided by the Paris juvenile authorities. While the courts tried to hash out this mess and determine who should gain custody of the baby, there was trouble a brewing at the Crawford residence. That's because Effie accused her husband's younger brother, Frank, of being the baby daddy. And of course, he vehemently denied this. She named me because she saw I was smart and I was onto her ways. I never laid a hand on her except once to shove her out of my mother's house. Frank continued, We never liked her. She was a come here. And if he's not going to leave her, he'll vacate too. That ain't even his house. It's his sister's. He ain't got nothing. The chickens even ain't his. Frank added regarding his brother, He says the doctor says she's in no condition to move. She's sick, he says. Well, I wish she died while she was about it. And he wasn't alone. The entire Crawford clan, which included Lewis's seven brothers, two sisters, their wives and husbands, and his 62-year-old widowed mother, they all wanted him to leave his two-timing wife. There was even talk of tar and feathering her, and then ultimately driving her out of town completely. Fearing for her life, Deputy Sheriff Clarence Crawford, that's another Crawford who's related by marriage, he was ordered to protect Effie from all and any violence. Lewis was torn as to what he should do. You know, he truly loved his wife. You know, and at first he stood by her and refused to give in to his family's demands. He avowed that he would, quote, stick with Effie through hell and high water until the end. But it wasn't long before he changed his tune. He later stated that he would, quote, would have to quit her when this thing's over because it would ruin my character to live with her. On November 16th, District Court Judge Robert D. Jones ruled that eight-day-old baby Moses, who was still in the hospital suffering from a slight cold, could be returned to Effie Crawford as soon as physical conditions permitted. The judge stated, quote, This woman misguided and errant though she was, has violated no prohibitory law of the state. Her actions were those of a woman driven frantic and desperate in fighting alone a battle in which she herself must have foreseen failure in defeat. He continued, 
many women would have abandoned their children rather than face the same terrifying circumstances. She is poor as thousands of others, but this cannot forfeit her rights. Her amazing fortitude in giving birth to this child under the horrible circumstances which surround her, and her insistent plea for the right to resume her burden of a child's care and protection, impel us to believe that here the child will find sanctuary and be under the protection of the one who will gladly sacrifice all, if necessary, in the full discharge of that self-imposed trust. He concludes, It is certain that the only mother who conceived and bore the child can give it the understanding, love, and affection it will so sorely need in its early future to overcome the somber circumstances of its birth. The couple reconciled and picked up their baby at the hospital on Wednesday, November 25th of 1936. We're going to name him Bert J. Moses Crawford. The Bert J. don't mean anything, but we don't want people calling him Moses. Lewis then added, It's our baby, and I don't care which one of Effie's stories was true, whether the dog brought the baby or whether Effie had him out behind the woodshed. Well, the Christmas of 1936 proved to be a great one for the Crawford family. Not only were they celebrating having their new child at home for the first time, but gifts of food, money, and clothing just poured in from all over the country. And it was not just for the baby, but for Effie Lewis and their two children also. The press did a follow-up story on Bert's first birthday, and everything was still going well. Bert was learning how to walk and talk, while everyone seemed to have just put it all behind them. Effie was now back in the good graces of her husband's family, and the community seemed to act as if nothing had ever happened at all. Of course, time marches on, and all the people mentioned the story are no longer with us. Louis Elijah Crawford, the dad, he was 51 years old when he left us on June 25th of 1944. After remarrying, Effie Crawford Schultz died at age 85 on November 12th of 1997. And Bert J. Moses Crawford was 73 years old when he passed away on February 10th of 2010. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. This holiday, buy gefilte fish in gleaming glass jars, made in the finest tradition of Passover under strict rabbinical supervision. Delicately light, always right. Gefilte fish in jars. Choose your favorite brand at your local food market. A message from the Specialty Foods Trade Institute. I'm betting you haven't heard many commercials for gefilte fish lately. <laughs> anyway, that commercial is from the 1950s, and it was featured on WEVD Radio in New York City. The station was started in August 1927 by the Socialist Party of America, and it was named after its former leader, Eugene Victor Debs, EVD. He had passed away the previous October, so it seemed appropriate to name the station after him. In 1932, the station was taken over by The Forward, which was a leading Yiddish newspaper in its day. The station reached its apex in the 1940s, and then listenership just dropped off after that. Now, that can be attributed to many reasons. For example, the popularity of TV, the assimilation of Jews into mainstream American culture, the Holocaust, of course, bringing the influx of Yiddish speakers to a near-abrupt halt, and Israel's decision to choose Hebrew over Yiddish as its official language. After many changes in formats, the channel was eventually picked up by ESPN, and it now operates under the call letters WEPN. As for gefilte fish, some consider it to be the sausage of the sea. And if you've never had it, it's basically ground up to boned fish, typically whitefish, pike carp, that's mixed with seasonings, matzo meal, and some other ingredients, and then it's poached. I kind of consider it like, you know, fish meatloaf. I must say that it was perhaps the food that I hated most while growing up. My mother's mom, my grandmother, loved it, and every time my grandparents came for a visit, there would be the jar of gefilte fish open on the table. Not only this, you know, I dislike the taste, the smell, the texture, it personally reminded me of white turds. Now, my cat Snowball, who's long deceased, 
She loved gefilte fish. It was the only food she would jump up on the table for. As soon as she got one whiff, you know, she was there. As for me, after about 40 years of trying to avoid gefilte fish, I recently decided to give it a try. And you know what? I didn't find it to be bad at all. Now, it's not like chocolate. I still don't plan to eat it regularly. But, you know, it was okay. But I must admit, it still looked like white turds to me. (laughs) So here's a question for you. A few weeks ago, my wife asked me as we're walking up the road, what is the difference between a tree and a shrub? Well, do you know the true difference? Just in case you don't know, hang around for a bit and I'll let you know the answer at the end of this podcast. In other news, here are a few short stories that I found of interest. In our first one, long before the Amityville horror made the village famous, the New York Times reported on February 9, 1903, that its citizens were hoarding pennies. And this probably doesn't come as much of a shock to you because people have been hoarding pennies for years. What's odd about this story is that they were only hoarding shiny 1902 pennies and nothing else. Why 1902 and why shiny? Well, it was all traced back to a Fulton Fish Market dealer named Alva W. Half. He was a resident of Amityville. And since his wholesale fish business required him to give his customers lots and lots of change, the Amityville Bank would contact him whenever they had too many small coins on hand. Eleven days prior to the story being published, he obtained 3,000 copper pennies from the bank. Since this occurred right after the holiday shopping season, the department stores had just given out tons of shiny new 1902 pennies as change for purchases made. Someone commented to Mr. Half about the shiny pennies, and he jokingly said that he was, quote, gonna take the coins and get the gold out of them. Next thing you know, a story started to spread that the coins were so shiny because a careless smelter had accidentally dropped a bar of gold into the molten copper. And you guessed it, suddenly people were checking every penny to see if they were 1902, and they kept them so they could cash them in to get the gold. Well, an analysis made by the public school chemistry class confirmed what you probably knew all along. The pennies contained no gold. Every penny was worth, you got it, one penny. So let's move on to our next story. You know, today we take for granted that we can keep people alive via artificial respiration. But of course, that wasn't always the case. Back in April of 1927, newspapers across the country reported on the progress of 18-year-old Walter L. Booth, who was being cared for in a hospital in Roanoke, Virginia. You see, Walter had become injured in a car accident on May 29th of 1926, And he did recover from his injuries and he went back to work, but then he fell ill months later. Unfortunately, partial paralysis soon set in and doctors determined that a fractured and dislocated vertebrae near the base of his skull was the cause. He failed to improve, so six weeks later he decided that surgery was his only option. It was during that procedure that his lungs collapsed and he could no longer breathe on his own. So with no machine to keep Walter alive, his friends were called into action. Two by two, working in 30-minute shifts, his friends just stood on either side of him and pumped his arms up and down. Doesn't that sound crazy? Well, the doctor said it was keeping him alive. His friends continued to do this day after day, you know, 24 hours a day, with the hope, of course, they would improve. Sadly... He continued to weaken, and on May 7th, that's 378 hours or nearly 16 days after that pumping started, Walter took his last breath. And lastly, do you remember when, you know, years ago, the signs outside most motels advertised free TV, air conditioning, and a swimming pool? Well, someone took that sign seriously on January 6th of 1961. That's when a man reserved 10 rooms at the Holiday Inn Motel in Jackson, Michigan, under the name of a well-known company. 
So with ten keys in hand, he went room to room and stole all of the 17-inch television sets. I mean, you can't blame him. After all, the sign did say, free TV. So a few minutes ago, I asked you what the difference was between a tree and a shrub. Now, most people have a general sense of what distinguishes one from the other, and I'm sure there are some that may disagree with what I'm about to say, but here is the answer from the book Identifying Wood by R. Bruce Hoadley. He just happens to hold a doctorate from Yale in wood technology. So woody plants are considered to be trees if they reach 20 feet or 6 meters in height at maturity, and they have a dominant single stem, you know, what we call a trunk. Now, if they're less than 20 feet in maturity, whether they have a single stem or not, they are considered shrubs. It's as simple as that. They're either trees or they're shrubs. So that got me thinking, what's the difference between a shrub and a bush? Well, good luck trying to figure that one out. That's because the terms are used interchangeably and they've lost a lot of their distinction. In general, a bush is a bit smaller than a shrub and its leaves touch the ground. A shrub, on the other hand, tends to be a bit taller, have thicker foliage, and of course its leaves don't touch the ground. In addition, bushes are typically found in the wild while shrubs are cultivated, they're pruned, and they're taken care of by mankind. Of course, the two words have become quite synonymous, so I doubt anyone is going to complain if you choose one term over the other. Personally, I think I'm just going to call them all shrubs. And if anyone disagrees with me, I'll just tell them to blame Dr. Holdley. Well, that brings another episode of the Useless Information Podcast to a close. I'd like to thank my wife, Mary Jane, for reading the part of Effie Crawford. I had her jump in at the last minute, and I think she did a really nice job. And just a reminder to like the show on Facebook, and if you haven't done so already... I would greatly appreciate it if you go over to iTunes and leave some positive comments about the show. The Useless Information Podcast is part of the Recorded History Podcast Network. Be sure to go to recordedhistory.net to learn about all the quality history podcasts that the network has to offer. Anyway, thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in the next time. Bye!